Today we are continuing in our study on the Gospel of Matthew, and today we arrive at the end of chapter 9 and into chapter 10. But before we get into that, I do want to um, give some credit where credit is due, give some praise where praise is deserved, and I do want to recognize two quarterbacks from last week. Uh, if you didn't know, there was a Super Bowl. Didn't know if you knew that. Um, my team wasn't in it, but that's okay. Um, but two quarterbacks I want to recognize. Let's go ahead and see them. Congratulations to Ryan Rhino Griffin and Blaine Gabs Gabbert. I mean, these guys were amazing. I am sure you've all heard of them. Several, who has a jersey? Who has a jersey for one of these guys? Somebody does. These guys were unbelievable. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating. These guys never played in the Super Bowl. They dressed up. They were stretched and ready to go. Let's, re let's delete that stretch from the live stream. But um, they were ready to go. They actually are going to get a Super Bowl ring, but you probably never heard of them. Why? Because a superstar, future Hall of Famer, actually took every snap, threw every pass. These guys never played a second in the game. Was their role important? Absolutely. I think we need to change the trend. I think we need to celebrate the backup quarterbacks. Anybody agree with me on that? I think we need to get some jerseys of those backup quarterbacks. I think we need to really, really give them the credit as the unsung heroes. Because honestly, they are. Let's go back a couple years. Three years ago, there was a team that entered into the playoffs and their star quarterback was injured. Does anybody know what team that was? The Eagles. The Eagles. Their starting quarterback was injured. Their backup came in, led them through the playoffs, led them to the Super Bowl, and they won. See, a backup has to be ready when called upon. Even a couple weeks ago, Kansas City Chiefs, their star quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, had a concussion, had to go out. This is an AFC championship game, and Browns fans were super excited to see him go out, but the backup came in who was where was he from, Daniel? I don't remember where he was from. Maybe Michigan and played against Ohio State. I don't know exactly. But ended up leading them to the win, and they continued on to the Super Bowl. They got beat, but they made it on. But that backup had to come in, and that backup had to take all the weight upon his shoulders. And I don't know about you. There's a reason why I was never a backup quarterback or a quarterback or anything. <laughs> I was in choir, jazz hands, and so um, <laughs> let's, let's clip that out as well. All right, moving on. Um, but because think about the pressure. Think about the pressure of being a backup quarterback. I mean, you are prepared. You go through all the motions, but you're sitting there watching the star. I don't know about you, but I would immediately, if a star got injured, I'd be like, um, uh, Coach, uh, this fingernail, uh, I have a hangnail, it's really been bothering me. Or I'd be, I'd be hiding in the restroom, something. That is too much pressure. Too much pressure. But these guys, they face that all the time. They are always ready. And they might go the whole Super Bowl and never get in, but they are valuable. How many times do we take the mindset, let me adjust my cord here. Okay. It's kind of pulling around here. How many times do we take the mindset where we are comfortable sitting on the sidelines? We are comfortable having somebody else be in the starting spot, and we just sit back. Maybe we do some stretches, but that's about it. How many times do we allow somebody else to do the work of Christ, the mission of the church, and we are comfortable on the bench. That's what we're going to look at today. Jesus called the 12 disciples to follow him. Now, Matthew captures a couple of those. He doesn't capture all of them, but there were 12 that were called to follow. 
and we're going to see them named today. But what happened was, is they were called to follow, and it would have been easy for them to sit back and go, Jesus, you are awesome. We are your biggest fans, Team Jesus, right? We see in chapters 8 and 9, Jesus doing these miracles, divine authority to heal, to cast out demons, divine authority to raise a young girl from the dead. And I could just imagine those disciples being like, this is the sweetest gig. We get to be rock stars with this guy and go around and see him do all these amazing things. Well, at the end of chapter 9, all of a sudden, the narrative begins to turn. All of a sudden, those bench warmer disciples who are completely comfortable with that role are called to mission. We actually see at the end of chapter 9, starting verses 37 through 38, we see Jesus say the following. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. He's talking about the lost, the broken, the hurting, those who do not have the hope of God, those who are stuck in the law, and they need a Savior. They need grace. And I can imagine the disciples going, wait a minute, what? Yeah, we, we agree the harvest is plentiful. We agree with that. But, but we don't need anybody else. But you, Jesus, you're the miracle worker. You, you are heaven with us. Why would we need workers? Well, that's where chapter 10 steps into a different kingdom than probably what they expected. You see, the kingdom of heaven is not about becoming saved and finding your bench or your pew and watching the show. That's not the kingdom of heaven. Matter of fact, we get a picture of what that is in Matthew chapter 10. But what I want us to understand is Jesus came to save, empower, and send. There's no such thing as bench warmers in the kingdom of heaven. We are all called to mission, and we are all called to take our place in serving and sharing. We are all called, and we're going to see this mission, this equipping and sending in the 12 disciples. But what we're going to see is that this is bigger than them. Let's go ahead and see Jesus, who has divine authority, give divine authority to his disciples. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority. Gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew. Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew's being real humble. I mean, he remembers where he came from. James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. And they were not letting him miss the label of what he did. Then Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Here are the twelve. But we see a radical turning point because they're not called to watch Jesus do a miracle show. They're not just to sit back and hold his water and run out and here, Jesus, have a drink. No. Here we see that Jesus gives them his authority so they can go and replicate his ministry. I mean, that's different. That is different from what we've seen to this point. But what we see here is this is just the beginning. This is not the final sending. This is not the final commission. We see the final sending and commission come after Jesus died for our sins and overcame the tomb. That's when Jesus, at the end of Matthew's gospel, 
calls all believers to go. He sends us all. But what we see here is that he is training them to have his heart, training them to live and move under his authority, training them for mission, and we see that that is very reminiscent of what he has called us to. Now today we're going to look at this, and we're just going to look at a portion. We're not going to look at all of chapter 10. I wish we had time to do that. But we're just going to look at a few verses And what we have to be careful when we look at this is we have to remember this is specific to the 12. You cannot take this word for word for you. Okay? This is specific to the 12. But there are parts of this that are consistent to the mission of all believers. So I'm going to highlight those when we get to it. Okay? But first, let's see how Jesus prepares them. Now, he gave them his authority to do miracles. Because that was needed to accompany the gospel, all right? But he also prepared them for what they would face. He did not water it down. He shared with them the opposition, the trials, the conflict and persecution they would face. Let's go ahead and see verses 16 through 24. Jesus warning, encouragement, and preparation for the twelve as they were sent on mission. Starting in verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Right there, most of us would be like, boop, I'm done. I've got an appointment. I've got something I've got to do, that hangnail. I've got to take care of it. I've got to work on my stretches, whatever. We would be out at that point. But Jesus is preparing them. Now, again, as you hear this, remember, he gave them his authority. So they're not going empty-handed. They're going with divine power, right? So, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. There will... Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Now, again, we read this understanding. This is very specific to the 12. But we also have to see the key truths that apply to all believers, and that's what I want to highlight. If you have your bulletins, you can follow along. It'll be on the screen. The first is this. The first key truth for all believers. There will be opposition. There will be opposition. Question, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with conflict? I know there are some of you here that face conflict and you're, you're, you're not scared, right? Some of you. There's a lot of you here that if conflict's that direction, you're going the other direction. You avoid it no matter what. And we have to understand that Jesus here makes it very clear to the disciples and to us that conflict is unavoidable when we are on his mission. The only way to avoid conflict, the only way to avoid opposition, is to avoid the mission of Jesus, and that is not an option if you're a follower of Jesus. It's not an option. If you believe Jesus is God's Son, and that Jesus died for you and came back to life victoriously and has called you to life living for him and his kingdom and his salvation and for his glory, then you are on mission. You are called to be a part, an extension of Jesus' ministry to the world. Let me put it this way. To follow Jesus is to be on mission by serving within the church family and sharing the hope of Jesus outside the church family. Okay? 
As a follower of Jesus, it's twofold. Serving within, sharing the hope outside of. And if any of you have led in any way, have served in any way, you know there's opposition. When we are dealing with people, we realize people equal complaints. People equal criticism, unmet expectations. And I'm just talking about serving within the church family. Okay? That's just with other believers. There is criticism, complaints, unmet expectations. But two things to remember. Two things to remember. First of all, be kind. Be kind to one another. Don't always complain. Don't always be negative. I know some of you, that's a natural disposition, but that is not a spiritual disposition, okay? We are called to build up, to edify each other, not to tear down, not to nitpick, not to always complain. So we need to be kind to each other and be kind to those who serve, those who lead by being grateful, supportive, and encouraging. Now the other side of that is we need to have grace for people. We need to have grace for people. We don't always know what they're going through. We don't always know what's going on. I, I remember once somebody snapped back about something or complained about something, and I just, I took it personal. I was just like, oh, how dare you? And I just was all, I, I mean, I was all bent out of shape and didn't realize until later what that person's week was like. Didn't realize a loss that they had faced. Didn't realize a burden on their heart. We have to have grace for each other. We have to have grace for people, even if they're grumpy, even if they nitpick. But we have to remember who we're serving. We have to remember who we are serving. We cannot let people keep us from serving in the church because we're not serving ultimately people. We're serving Jesus, the head of the church, King, Lord, Savior. It's his church. They are his people. We must be kind and have grace for each other. Now, that's within serving within the church, all right? Outside the church, Jesus outlined clearly to his disciples that people would hate them because they hate Jesus. That people would persecute them because they persecute Jesus. Now, I pray none of us are beat or put in jail because of sharing our faith. But we have to make sure that that would never stop us either. We have to understand that there is not always going to be open arms, and I've been waiting my whole life to hear you share your testimony response. Sometimes people are going to reject that. Sometimes people are going to be offended. Sometimes people are going to relationally distance. I mean, Jesus outlines that when we choose him, serve him, love him, there can even be family members that say, I don't want anything to do with you. And we have to choose, first of all, who we serve, and we have to be able to understand that that is what happens. Because ultimately, they're not rejecting us. And that's hard. They're ultimately rejecting the hope, the truth, the love, the power of Jesus Christ. And we can't take it personal. We can't take it personal. Jesus told the apostles, expect opposition. You see, he said, be shrewd as snakes. That doesn't mean to be tricky and sneaky. That means go with eyes wide open and don't go naive and like a super sensitive person that every time someone says, I don't want to hear about Jesus, you're like, oh, everybody hates me. No, you've got to know what you are walking into, but never lose the heart that Jesus sent us to walk into. I'll never forget a little boy that I met, and this little boy had been beat repeatedly. And during the times he wasn't being beat, whenever he would say something wrong, his grandpa would take a cigarette butt and burn him. 
And when I met that boy, I wanted to just hug him. I wanted to say, you are smart. You are kind. You are important. I wanted to tell him about God's love. But see, that boy was so hurt that every adult was not safe. Every adult was not safe. Any physical touch was not safe. And so for me, it had to be to show him love and to show him care and grace from a distance. Show it in a way that he could receive it and feel safe. We eventually got him in a foster home, and they were unbelievable. They were patient. They didn't take it personal. And their love was unrelenting. You see, many unbelievers see Christians like that. They see Christians like that. And we have to understand that their opposition, the conflict, their rejection is not personal. They are just hurt, and they are broken. But the only way that we can stay on mission and not get put off or not get offended or take it too personal, the only way is to guard our hearts for people. And here's an important truth. We have to guard our hearts for people by having Jesus' heart for people. Guard our hearts whether it's serving within the fam, church family, whether it's sharing our faith, whether it's being a light in the world, talking to our coworkers or our family about our faith in Christ, whatever it is, we need to have our hearts guarded by having Jesus' heart. And we see that at the end of chapter 9 where Jesus said, pray, pray for the workers because the harvest is plentiful. Well, where did that come from? It started by Jesus having compassion. We have to have the compassion of Jesus for people or we're going to be checked out. We're going to be like, coach, don't put me in a game because they are losers, they're jerks, and they're mean. We have to have Jesus' heart to persevere a mission and not take it personal. This is what happened leading up to Jesus' call to pray. In verse 35 through 38, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Here's the key part. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He had compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. For us to pray for the workers to lead the lost to Jesus, we need to pray for the heart of Jesus. Because that's the only way we are going to maintain as innocent as doves, but shrewd as snakes. Because our heart is guarded, we are able to stay on mission, not get our feelings hurt, not get burnt out, and stay faithful because... Our heart belongs to the one who called us. That is key. That's important. That is so important for us. To have Jesus' heart means we are not naive to conflict. We expect it, but we always are on mission and trust Jesus through it all. The last thing that I want us to apply, and this is just very brief, that even though there will be opposition, there will be provision there will be provision. A backup quarterback might feel nervous, might feel even scared coming into a big game and having all that pressure, but their coaches hopefully have prepared them, given them all the tools they need to enter in the game and fulfill the responsibility. When we read the instructions and challenges that the disciples were prepared for, we cannot read that without remembering that Jesus gave them his authority. Jesus gave them his authority. They did not go out in their own power. They did not go out in their own ability. They went out with Jesus' authority, with his provision to go and fulfill that which he called them to do. So in short, when Jesus calls, he equips. If Jesus calls you to share your faith, 
with a family member or a neighbor or calls you to serve them in a way that opens the door for you over time to share your testimony. You need to trust in the provision of Jesus Christ. You're not doing it on your own. If you do it on your own, then you are stepping out of the one who called you. That authority that he gave the disciples was in unity with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And see, that is our provision. He has given us, for those who accepted Christ and belong to Christ, we are filled with the very Spirit of God. And that is how we serve. That is how we share. That is how we are a light in the darkness. We see that Spirit given to the disciples in verses 19 and 20. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. The same provision is given to us. If you are called to serve within the church for little kids and and to teach them, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us grow and to prepare us and to help us lead them and love them or if it's in the worship ministry, or if it's facil- facilities, whatever it is, it is through the Spirit's provision. The same thing when we go out into the world. We rely on the Spirit to give us the words. We do not walk in our authority. We walk in the authority of Jesus in the Spirit's provision. We see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. There are different gifts, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. If Jesus calls, he equips. So we don't get discouraged Because we have our heart guarded by praying for Jesus' heart. And we don't walk in our own ability. We walk in the provision of the Holy Spirit that equips the church to do the work of the church. I'd like to close with this. I'd like to close with this. The question then becomes, are we content to be recipients of the mission of Christ Or are we ready to become participants in the mission of Christ? We were not called to the bench. We were called to mission. May we receive what Christ has done, but then may we be filled to go and continue that ministry of Christ as the church, as followers of Christ, as believers, as those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That is who we are. That is who we are. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for just giving us a picture of that training, that preparation, what the disciples would face. But God, we know that at the end of Matthew's gospel, through your spirit, you spoke that commission to all believers. That through the authority of Jesus, we have been called to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in your name, in the Spirit's name, in your Son's name, and teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded. God, may we receive, receive that filling, that preparation. May we walk faithfully in that preparation so we can live on mission. And it doesn't matter if we're in elementary, junior high, we can still be a light. We can still share the hope we have even at that age. It doesn't matter if if we are older and we feel like our years of serving are over. God, we need to then invest in the next generation Do not be a stumbling block, but a stepping stone for the next generation. And God, even if we feel inadequate, if we feel insecure, if we lack the courage, God, may we step out of our ability and step in your provision and live in a way that is constantly 
giving you glory, pointing people to you, and sharing the reason for the hope that we have. God, thank you that you have invited us to be your family, but you've called us to serve each other in that family. And thank thank you that you have called us to a mission, a gospel, that is to share Jesus with the world. That God, may we do so with eyes wide open, not taking it personal, always guarding our heart by praying and receiving the heart of Christ, and always, always relying on the provision of your spirit to do so. God, we worship you, we love you, we praise you. May each one today receive what you are speaking to them and how you would lead them from this point on. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.